So moving on then just to the, the exercise selection, as I said, as I said, just there, you know, obviously if you're doing exercises that you enjoy all the time, rather than those that you hate, that has the potential to be less fatiguing, or it has the potential to be more fatiguing if you push yourself to failure all the time, whereas you might put in any effort to exercises that you don't enjoy. So, you know, take that for what you will. Uh, that depends on the person, depends on the program, etc. Now, the important detail here is that different exercises contribute different levels of fatigue. And fatigue is a vague term. And deliberately so in a way and that's kind of why I like using it because when we talk about fatigue like all I care about like it, it's like we don't care about like the specific uh you know um millimole of muscle glycogen or whatever within the cell like that's not what matters what matters to us is how do you feel after the session how do you feel going into the next session are you progressing and are you getting injured they're the things that really matter Okay, so that's what we're that's what we're focused on, and that's why a vague term actually works well here. And when we focus on, let's say, a deadlift, for example, and we try to quantify the fatigue, you know, we could say that, okay, well, you get one unit of fatigue on your glutes and hamstrings, and you get one on the lower back, but you know, you kind of get half a unit of fatigue on the quads and half a unit of fatigue in your forearms, etc. But what really matters is asking yourself, how does this fit into your overall program? And what we know is that when you're using more overall musculature. Um, like in a deadlift, that that's going to be having greater overall impact on your fatigue. Okay, so even looking at that and calling it one unit, of, one unit of hamstring fatigue, and comparing that to like a lying leg curl, it's just not a fair comparison because very clearly there's a difference there in terms of the overall amount of muscle that you're using, um, and that's fairly intuitive if you've ever trained, you know, if you've been to a gym. So deadlifts, squats, overhead presses more complex exercises like clean and press, et cetera. Basically any movement, particularly those where your whole body is under load. Some people call it axial loading um, and you're using lots and lots of muscles together. That's generally going to be a lot more fatiguing than an isolation type exercise. And in particular, the fatigue there is going to be greater systemically. Okay. So the overall fatigue, fatigue um, on the, the system, on your physiology. However, if you focus on something like, a, uh, let's say, a seated leg curl, if you're doing a seated leg curl, you mightn't feel that fatigued after it in terms of systemic fatigue, but you might actually have a lot more muscle soreness after the seated leg curls in your hamstrings than you would um, if it was a, a deadlift. And this is kind of the difference between local and systemic fatigue. And this is, you know, it's, it's, it's enough of a spec. It's, it, it is important to specify at least that far. Okay. You have to ask yourself, what's the systemic fatigue and what's the local fatigue in that case, there's actually another level of analysis that sometimes becomes important, more important for some muscles than others. And that is what range of motion or rather what muscle length is this exercise training that muscle at the seated leg curl is a good example because the seated leg curl and the lying leg curl train the hamstrings at opposite ends of that muscle length spectrum. When you do a lying leg curl, your hamstring is really short at that end position. When you're at the so-called stretch position, your hamstring still has plenty of length left to go. When you're in the seated leg curl, you're going to be accentuating the stretch or maximizing the stretch or load on that stretch rather than that shortened position. So the difference there is that when a muscle is trained in its lengthened range, that generally leads to more soreness and or muscle damage in the days to follow. And as a result, that's going to carry a, I guess, a, a higher unit of fatigue in some sense than the lying leg curl. Okay. So they're both applying a stimulus to the hamstrings. They both carry a certain amount of fatigue, but the soreness that's going to accumulate is going to be greater for that seated leg curl. That's one of the really important principles to get here when it comes to exercise selection, because there's actually inherent limitations in getting some muscles into their length and range. The classic one is shoulders. Some people feel like they can do as much shoulder volume as they want without any um, excessive muscle soreness. And that's because it's quite difficult to get um, the deltoids into their length and range. And in particular, it's very difficult to get the lateral fibers or the outer fibers or middle fibers um, into their length and range, because what happens with those is that as you begin to stretch them, well, you kind of run into the side of your body. So you can't really do much about that. So they can get into a longer position when your arms in front or your arms behind, but in general, they're not getting stretched very much. 
So you can do tons and tons of lateral raises without that much muscle soreness. Whereas if you were to do the same volume of RDLs and seated leg curls, your hamstrings would be in bits. Okay. There's other more, you know, there's other minutia there in terms of the average um, length of specific muscles, like where they're strongest, different muscles vary in terms of um, what sarcomere length they're going to produce the most force, most force at, et cetera. But that stuff is, is not particularly relevant for this conversation. The main thing is, you know, are there exercises, like in terms of the practical application of this, are there exercises that leave you feeling way sorer than others? And if so, be more tentative when adding in extra sets of those. So I would generally be a lot more conservative when adding in sets of RDLs and seated leg curls than I would be giving someone sets of lateral raises. Like I'll, if someone wants to do more shoulder work, I'll say, yeah, go on, add in four sets of lateral raises, do them to failure, it's no problem. Okay, it's not gonna be a big deal. But the same thing could not be said for hamstrings. You do four sets of seated leg curls to failure, focusing on that length and range, and your hamstring is going to be sore for days, especially if you're not used to it. So it's kind of the, the final, there's, there's definitely loads more we could discuss, but I think that's that's the final basic point. Um, yeah, I, I want to just move it on to, to kind of wrap this up. There are obviously, look, we look at the training session, how we organize the training, and that's obviously where this fits into the overall training series discussion that we've been having. However, as we've been touching on, you do have to look beyond that. And there are a few things that we can look beyond that too. Obviously, managing stress in your daily life, as we discussed, it's not just the training stress that we have to look at, it's lifestyle stress. So again, that's beyond the scope of this podcast, but it is something that we need to look into. Sleep obviously plays a role in this. Again, it plays a role in that recovery, that recharging, etc. As does eating enough, you know, it's going to fuel the training session itself, but also it's going to fuel the recovery from the training session, right? And we touched on it in the previous podcast, but periodizing your training, that's why it is important to do, right? It is important to periodize your training so that we can actually manage fatigue across the months, across the years, 